Hello and welcome to Mini Metal Made, a show about how to do stuff with your mini metal maker. I'm your host, David Hardcop. So today we're going to look at how to turn a drawing into a metal object using your mini metal maker. Here's an example of a drawing that I did, and then some examples of the final prints of uh, the item after it was fired uh, with the mini metal maker. So to turn a drawing into a metal object, we're going to look at the big picture overview first. The major steps are you're going to create and scan your art. You're going to convert it to 3D using some different software. And then finally, we'll go through the stages of printing it to create the final object. Now the tools that we're going to use are, first of all, a desktop scanner. You'll need a personal computer with internet access. Your mini metal maker, metal clay 3D printer. And then finally, an electronic kiln, like the kind you would use with metal clay. Now in terms of the software that you need to use, you can download all of it for free. It's open source software. The first program is Inkscape. Inkscape is very similar to Adobe Illustrator. If you already have Illustrator, you won't need to download Inkscape. Tinkercad. Tinkercad is an online 3D modeling program. It's actually very cool. You can just go to tinkercad.com, set up a free account, and use it anywhere. It stores your objects on the cloud and it's very easy to use and uh, surprisingly effective at making all kinds of models. The program Slicer will be used to convert a 3D model into sliced layers, or in other words, a tool path used by the printer. And finally, Print Run. Print Run is the controller or host software for the Mini Metal Maker printer. Now, if we want to look at the detailed overview of what we're going to look at right now, the first thing we'll do is we'll scan the drawing, then we'll use Inkscape to create outlines, so in other words, we'll convert it to vector form. We'll import that vector into the 3D program, Tinkercad, and we'll use Tinkercad to extrude it to make it 3D. Then we'll use Slicer to create a tool path, uh, in other words, to slice up the, the 3D object file and make it compatible with the 3D printer and then we'll print it using the Mini Metal Maker. And then I'll show you how to set it up with the kiln and how to finish your object when it's done. So let's look right now at the first step. We're going to scan the drawing using the scanner and I'm going to set it to 300 dpi plus and we'll just have black and white and what we want from this step in the end is a JPEG image or a PNG or a .bmp image file type. Okay, so I'm first just going to do a drawing. I'm using a Sharpie because it's nice and dark against a white page. It doesn't have to be black on white, but it should be very high contrast. There we go. Now I'm just going to go ahead and put it into my flatbed scanner, and we'll start the scanning software. So your scanner software may or may not look like this. It should have the same basic elements to it some place that will let you choose which scanner you're scanning from and I'm gonna do just a basic overview scan there there so you can see I have the entire notebook etc most scanning software will let you select a region and then to do the final scan what I'm interested in is having a true black and white image now you can select color black and white, or in this case I could choose text and it really just clips things to either black or white and I think that's great. I'll go with that. I'm going to use 300 dpi. Higher the better, honestly, especially if you're dealing with something that's very small. I made my drawing kind of big, but you can actually go quite high with most scanners. I'll just stick with, I'll stick with 300 for this case. And it's going to scan to pictures. Maybe I'll put it to the desktop so I don't lose it and I'll just say scan. Good. Now if I look here, it is saved automatically as a .png. I chose that from the file format here, and that's one of the three types of files we can use.
Now that we're scanned, let's go to the next step, which is to create an outline. We're going to use Inkscape, and uh, Inkscape can import or open any of these file types, JPEG, PNG, or BMP. And I'll show you right now how to use it to trace it, and then we'll export it, actually we'll save it, as a .svg, which is a vector file type. So I've just started Inkscape. Inkscape is an open source vector based drawing program, so it draws with shapes and not with pixels. It runs in something called the X11 environment, so if you're starting this on your computer for the first time, don't be surprised if you see something called X11 start. It's perfectly normal. When you start Inkscape, you'll have a blank document, and I'm just going to go up here to File, Import, and then from my browser, I'll pick the scan that I made. Here it is, Scan 1 PNG. I just made that. You can see a preview here. Open. I want it to be embedded and not linked. There it is. There's the scan, and I can kind of move it into position on the page. I can also grab from the corners. Notice if I just stretch like this, it, it stretches around. If I hold down the Shift key, it will constrain proportions. Make it so it fits on the page. Now, if you were to zoom in and look at this very closely, you'll see that it is made of lots of pixels. It's just a drawing, so I just imported it, and I'm going to hold the shift down to click and zoom out. The next thing we're going to do is convert this to a vector shape. So what I want to do is I want to select that imported drawing. You can see it's selected. It has the box. Then I'll come up here to Path, Trace Bitmap. I'll pull this down so you can see it. This is the Trace Bitmap dialog menu. I have it set to Brightness Cutoff. These thresholds are fine. And that looks fine. This is all default settings. So if you make yours look like this, you should be fine. I'll press OK. It did it. I'm going to go ahead and close this menu. Now, it doesn't look like anything happened, but if I click and drag, I now have two, two versions of my piece. And if I were to take the magnifying glass and look at them very closely, so we'll look at this one. Notice this one is made up of pixels, but the one next to it, and I'll scroll over, is not. The one next to it looks very, very smooth. In fact, it is infinitely smooth because it is a vector shape now. To show you what that means, I'll show you, well, first of all, I'm going to, I'm going to delete the original and move the vector shape on here. And we're going to do a little bit of cleanup because you can see there are some dots and holes that I don't want in my print. Now, vector shape, if I click on path and I go up here to object to path. Now if I were to grab this tool, it's the point select tool, you can see all of these tools, or all of these points up here. If I zoom in, these points are in fact what defines the shape. So there are no, there are no pixels, you're just dealing with little vector points. It's, each one of these is, is a, a kind of spline control. So it is a point you can move around, and there are little handles. You can stretch the handles in different directions. And the whole shape is a bunch of spline controls connected by curved lines. And that's, that's what a vector is. So to go in here and repair a little bit of this, let's find, oops, and I've gone too far. Here's a spot I don't want. I'm just going to drag a box around it using this tool the Edit Paths by Nodes tool, I'll just hit Delete. And I can move right along. Here's another, another set. I'll just hit Delete. I'm just going to kind of crawl over, crawl over this whole shape, looking for small mistakes that I can fix, small things that could be, there's one, small things that could be removed or patched. If you are in a situation where 
you select, let's see if I can find one. Um, if I click on one, I can delete just individual points that might smooth out that bump that was there. I think I may have, I think I may have done it. Oh, looks like there's one right here. So I'll zoom, zoom in. If you're doing this and you're selecting points and clearing them, if you have to select a bunch of points, but I only want these, you can press shift and click on the other points that you don't want selected. They will deselect. And I can hit delete. Looks like I caught one there, but it looks okay. Now, if I zoom out and look at this shape, looks like maybe there's a little detail here that I should look at. Maybe, yeah, maybe I'll, I'll delete that point and I'll move that one down. I can make tiny adjustments. Now is a great time in this process to make small adjustments. I don't want to make it perfectly smooth. I'm going for that slightly hand-drawn look. Yours will probably be better. I couldn't draw perfectly round. But uh, there we go. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to save this out as a .svg file and all you have to do is go up to File, File, Save As, and I'll put it on the desktop so I don't lose it. And I can, I have a number of options, but I'm just going to choose this one, plain SVG, and it's a .svg type, and I'll press save. And that was it. Great, now that we have our vector file type, let's go to Tinkercad. We're going to import the SVG file into Tinkercad. We'll use Tinkercad to extrude that into a 3D form, and then as a last step, we'll export it as a .stl file. All right, we're in Tinkercad. I went to tinkercad.com and logged in with my free account. You can set up a free account too. I think you can actually create a login through your Facebook account if you want to. Tinkercad is a cloud-based, web-based 3D modeling program. These are all different items that I've created. And if you want to create a new design, you could just go to Create New Design. All right, once Tinkercad loads, you have a work plane, so this is a 3D environment. You can think of this as a workbench where you will work on your 3D objects. And I have some tools and tabs over here, and there's some items across the top. Well, first things first, I'll close that tab. Let's import our SVG drawing that we made. I'll come over here to Import. We're going to import from a file. You'll click on Choose File. and here is the drawing that we created. It gives me a preview even. I'll press open and then press import. It'll take a moment or two. Whoa, there it is. So the scale can be changed. It's respecting the scale originally set up on that SVG that we that we created in Inkscape. If I want to shrink this, I can go to one of the corners. If I click I hold down the shift key, it will constrain proportions so it doesn't stretch or bend it. And I can grab the shape from the middle anywhere and move it to reposition. Now, the three main controls that let you change your perspective in Tinkercad are first and foremost zooming. That's the scroll wheel. You can do that with your, your index finger on the scroll wheel. Zoom in, zooming in, zooming out. Whoa, don't mean to make you sick. If I click, uh, right click and drag, it's sort of like panning the camera around. So you can change your perspective to different sides. The other thing you can do is if you click down on that scroll wheel and then, and then move, you move your perspective. So you can get closer to the floor, go higher, and sort of move left and right. So you'll get used to working in the 3D environment. It's important to keep changing your perspective though so you understand what you're looking at. Now when I imported this it automatically created some depth. See how it's not perfectly flat. It actually has some depth to it. If I wanted to change that depth I can click on this handle on the top so the object has four handles at the four corners and then one handle in the middle and that handle determines depth so 
Okay, I could stretch this way up. That's not so much a pendant as, I guess, a big bead now. I can move it down. Notice it's snapping in increments. It's snapping to the grid, and the grid right now is set to millimeters, and it's snapping to one millimeter. And I know that because if I hover over the handle, you can see the size 52 millimeters by 58 millimeters. If I wanted to change that, in other words, and it's three millimeters tall, if I wanted to change the grid snapping, I can come down here. The controls are in the corner. I could turn grid snapping off. And now if I zoomed in, I have very fine control over the height. Now, if millimeters doesn't make sense to you and you want inches, you can click on Edit Grid and switch to Inches, Update Grid, and it, snap, it set the grid snap automatically to an eighth of an inch. I'll turn that off. So now we can see, oh, this object is two and a quarter inches by two and a quarter inches. I'm, I want it to be one inch, so I'll click and drag that in. It looks like these squares are in fact one inch in size, so that's a good guide too. But I can see, move this down to the point that, there, one inch by 0 0.991 inches, and now it fits right within a square. I have a one inch by one inch object. I think it looks nice. If I wanted to add something to this, for instance, maybe uh, I want this to be a uh, a pendant or I want them to link together and I wanted to add another ring. I kind of made rings here, but if I wanted to add something to this, we can come over here. I'll close this import tab. And if I open up the geometric tab, I have a bunch of shapes. Tinkercad is very good about letting you build objects out of shapes. So if I if I wanted to add something like a ring to this, whoa. So there's a, a big donut. It's a torus. I just dragged it right in. I can click on the corner. I'll hold down shift and I can shrink it down. This would be as if I wanted to add another ring to the side of this pendant. Or maybe I want the rings to be rounded and not, as you can see, just a little cookie cutter slice. I can adjust the height of the ring object. Anyway, I'll just I'll just say for argument's sake, I want that ring to be right there. Now, if I wanted to, I can select the entire object by dragging a box over it. And at the top, there's a, a button called Group. Press Group, and now it's all one object, including this ring I stuck on the side. Now, I don't actually want that ring to be there, so I can actually come up here and just ungroup just as easily, effectively taking it apart. And if I press delete, it goes away. So you have a lot of freedom to add things together and take things apart again in Tinkercad. It's great. Now, this is a one by one by, let's see how tall, by 0 0.040. Maybe I should make that, make it an eighth of an inch tall. An eighth of an inch is point, there it is. It actually gave me. 0.125, so it's an eighth of an inch tall. Although now that I'm looking at that, it looks too tall. So I think it's it's good. It's nice to have a 3D view of what you're making. It can let you make aesthetic decisions before you actually create the object. Well, I'm pretty happy with that. Right now, Tinkercad has named this object for me. It's called the Sizzling Jaban Elzing, whatever that is. It's kind of funny. I'm going to rename it. I can click on Design, Properties, and I'll call it David Pendant 1, Save Changes. Okay, so those, save, those changes are saved. The last step now is how do I download this so that I can 3D print it? It's very easy. In Tinkercad, all you have to do is go up to Design, Download for 3D Printing, and then we'll choose the .stl file type. Click on that, and it is done. It just downloaded it. I can close this, and if I'm done with this object and I want to close it, I can just click up here in the Tinkercad icon, 
and it closed it. Notice it saved David Pendant right here. So it's going to load and create a little preview, but it saves it right along with all my other objects. If I don't want an object, so in other words, I don't want to save it, I don't really want this object, I can click here where it says Actions and click on Delete, OK, and it disappears. So that is Tinkercad for extruding in a nutshell. Now let's get into the nitty gritty and show you how to set up Slicer to create the toolpath for your 3D printer. Slicer is an open source program. You can go back and look at how to download it. Basically, Slicer will import .stl file types. In the end, what we'll do is we'll export the object in its sliced format, which is a .gcode file. So I've just loaded Slicer. It's a free open source program, and it's designed to take in an STL file and produce the G-code file that you need to actually run the printer. When Slicer first loads, it has just the default settings. So what I'd like to do is show you how to load the config file that we've set up for the Mini Metal Maker. The first thing to do is to just go up to File, Load Config, and there will be a config file that we've included with some of our materials, whether it be a download or something on a CD that you received. We'll let you know. I'll click on that, press Open, and now notice each of these setting tabs has the config file that we loaded. Also, you can see that the build platform has changed size. It shrank because the Mini Metal Maker has a very small build platform. The next thing we'll do is load our object. If I go up here to Add, I can choose the STL file we created called David Drawing, and there it is. Now, we can print one of these, but the beauty of having a 3D printer is that you can create multiple copies of the same thing once you're set. You effectively have a factory for making things out of metal. So let's make a few. I'll add more. There. Now we have four on the stage of the Mini Metal Maker, and you can see they fit with plenty of room. I can click on a tab here to see the 2D plot. This shows you how they'll be laid out. And I could click on a preview. The preview shows you, if I zoom in, shows you how the actual layers are put down and the path that the tool takes laying out the clay. Now I can erode the layers to look at the whole situation if I wanted to. I can put it back up. I think it's very interesting to see. It, it lets you understand what the machine is going to do when it's all set up. So now the only thing left to do is to export the G-code. I'm going to press this and it will produce the G-code file. And save. Great. Now we have a .gcode file from Slicer. Let's go to printing. Now we're going to use the program Print Run to connect to the Mini Metal Maker printer. We'll import the .gcode file. And once the printer is all set up and aligned and we have clay in it, we'll hit print and let the printer produce the object in metal clay. Let's look at that right now. I've started Pronterface, otherwise known as Print Run. It's the piece of control software we looked at in the first video that talked about how to hook up your printer. I'm going to go ahead and turn on the Mini Metal Maker. Switch is there. And I'm also going to connect to the Mini Metal Maker by pressing Connect. Now, if the controls don't become active right away, it may be because you have your USB settings wrong. You could click on this, and you may have a couple of different choices. All right. The next thing I want to do is I want to load the object that we're going to print. I'll go to File, Open. It brings up a dialog box, and I'll choose my David Pendant 1 G-Code Open. There. Now you can see the G-Code has been loaded into Print Run. If I want to view the layers, I can click on this, and it opens a window, and I can step through the individual layers that the printer will go through. In this case, they're very thin objects, and it looks like we're only going to have five layers of thickness. We had the layer height set down, so we'll have thin objects, and uh, the next thing we're going to do is go ahead and load the clay. Now, looking at this piston, if the piston is down into your ring holder, you won't be able to remove this from the printer. You'll need to come over here to the extrude setting. I'll set that to 50 
and I could press reverse and that would move this piston up. We have lots of room right now. The piston is at the very top. So I'll just slide this out and I have a fresh cartridge of metal clay. I'm going to remove the moisture cap, remove the end cap, and I can slide the clay in and we'll tighten that. And then I will slide that whole cartridge right into the extruder body. I can see that this would line right up and we'll just tighten it by hand. You never have to use any tools. This should always just be easily tightened by hand. Now the next thing is we're going to run the extruder piston in until the clay begins to flow. I'll set this from 50 to 500. That will let the extruder rotate for a while. That way we don't have to keep pressing the extrude button over and over. I'm going to press extrude and you'll see this piston is slowly now moving down into the tube. It's normal that there's some movement in this. There is a universal joint right here that lets it move around a little bit and it actually accommodates any small differences in the way things are aligned. So it's a good thing that it can move. We're going to watch here very carefully and when the clay begins to flow I'm going to come up and press disconnect and then reconnect and that will stop the machine from moving. I can put my hand under here if I wanted to. Okay, disconnect, reconnect. You can see that the piston is seated and it pushed some clay out of the cartridge. This makes sure there's no dried clay that will get caught into the nozzle. The next step is we're going to place one of these nozzles onto the cartridge. Right now the clay is loaded. We're going to get this system primed. So I'm going to wipe the last little bit again. I'll put a fresh nozzle onto the cartridge. There we go. Again, they just tighten on by hand. You don't have to use any tools to do this. Now I'm going to come over here and I'm going to change the extrude setting from 500 just to 5. That way we can extrude in very small increments and I'm going to press extrude. Notice how the nozzle is just being filled with clay. Small steps. I'm going to press this maybe three or four times until the clay just begins to flow from the end. Almost. Okay. So you can see just a small thread of clay beginning to flow. That's good. Now, if I wasn't quite ready to print yet, maybe I didn't have this loaded, what I could do is I could place this nozzle bath. This is a small cup of water with a magnet on the bottom. I could place it directly underneath and then I could press Z home and you'll see it's going to just put the nozzle right down into the water bath. It will make contact and stop. Yeah, that's fine. Now we could take as long as we want because the nozzle will not dry. We could set things up, choose a different object. When I'm ready to print though, what I'll do is elevate the nozzle by pressing Z I pressed 10, that's 10 millimeters, and that should bring it up enough to clear it. I will press extrude one more time, just to make sure that there is some flow happening in the nozzle. And that looks good. And when everything is set, all I have to do is press print. The system will go to the 0, 0 start position. I might wish to wipe a little bit of this away. It makes contact with the build plate, setting the zero, and now it begins the print. You can see it's pressurizing right now. This line goes from very thin to very thick. It's essentially forcing this piston down to bring the total pressure up to a known value, and it will begin the process of printing. Right now it's printing this skirt around the object, and you can see on print run you can kind of follow along and see what it's doing in terms of g-code by which part of the line is turned red. It's going to move all the way around, essentially outlining the work, normalizing the clay flow, and then it can go and begin the first of the four objects. If for any reason I need to stop the print, I can come up here 
and click on pause, which is right here, or I can press disconnect and then reconnect again, and that will stop the print in place. Great, so we've gone through all the steps of producing the artwork all the way up through printing it, and now we have our objects in metal clay. They're not fired yet. Let's look at the next and final steps. Firing and finishing. A metal clay object, once it's dry, can be cleaned up. In other words, it can be sanded, uh, edges can be adjusted or filed, or even cut using something like an X-Acto blade or a little scalpel blade. Once you're satisfied with that object in its unfired form, we're going to move it into the kiln and set up the kiln according to these firing schedules. You can see we're using the bronze clay 3D firing schedule. For other clays, see our website. There's a firing schedule for each of them. In the end, you will have the final object, which can be polished and finished using some different methods. So that's it. You can see we fired it in the kiln. We've gone through the steps to polish and finish, and you now have some very nice 3D metal objects based on your original drawing. This has been Mini Metal Made, how to do stuff with your mini metal maker. I hope you enjoyed the show. I hope it was informative. Please let me know. I would love to hear your comments. Thank you.